Welcome everyone to the fourth talk in this series under the theme of spiritual depression. If you followed these Bible studies, you'll know that we've been diagnosing the reasons for the discouragement and despair that the psalmist felt. Our three previous talks were entitled Spiritual Dryness, Spiritual Loneliness and Spiritual Weakness. But today we're going to look at the topic of spiritual bitterness. Have you ever been so downcast and depressed that you felt God had forgotten you and that God had forsaken you? This can so easily happen when facing an unexpected tragedy, the loss of a special member of your family, or a protracted and debilitating illness for which there seems to be no care, cure, or a bitter and unresolved conflict in your family or place of work for which there seems to be no answer. Discouragement and despair can take over and we can feel so far from God that we can feel he has forgotten us. And so feeling bruised and broken, we cry out in God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? Why don't you listen to me? If you've ever felt like that, you're not alone. Many others in the Bible and in everyday life have expressed the same painful feeling. Many people during the current coronavirus pandemic have felt desperately alone and broken because they've not been able to sit by the one they love as they withered away, dying with that vicious virus, COVID-19. Some have been interviewed and are just sad and broken, while others are bitter and quick to blame the government or the NHS. It is so difficult if you're present when a family member dies. Like the woman who wrote, I watched, watched helplessly as my husband's wife withered away. I'll never forget those grief-stricken eyes, sad, hollow and distant. He was a good man in his early forties, the father of my two children. What good, what meaning can I find in the death of my husband? How could a good God let this happen? Listen to the cry of the psalmist in Psalm 42 as he reaches rock bottom in his depression. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? And then again, you're God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why have you forgotten me, he says? Why have you rejected me? The first three causes that we looked at of his despair were understandable, but this is where he really goes wrong. He starts to complain against God. He's feeling resentful and bitter, and his complaint is a bit of a dirge. Why have you forgotten me? Why have you rejected me? But Jesus never forgets his people. That is a truth that's stamped all over the pages of Scripture. He's promised never to leave us, never to abandon us. We may feel he does, but our feelings are an unreliable test as to what is real. The way we feel does not alter the promises God has made. Feelings don't alter facts. Because we feel depressed does not mean that God has broken his promise to never abandon his people. We have an example of this in Isaiah 49. When the children of Israel were torn away from their homeland and held in captivity by the Babylonians, they naturally felt depressed. They were convinced God had rejected them. In captivity they wailed, God has forgotten us. The Lord has forsaken us. God replied in a very tender way, and he used an extremely moving picture that they would all understand. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget you, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. It is unthinkable that a mother would forget her newborn baby. But even if that was possible because of human weakness, God will never forget us, however deep our distress. So we can see now that the psalmist is giving in to self-pity and unbelief, 
which is such a human tendency whenever we find ourselves in the midst of crippling circumstances. I once heard a psychiatrist say, most forms of normal depression stem from self-pity. When we curve in on ourselves and give in to self-pity. Let me again underline, I'm not talking about clinical depression, which needs the help of the medical profession, but rather the broken and desperate feelings we experience when everything seems to go wrong. Somebody else has said, the most depressing person to live with is not the proverbial mother-in-law, but yourself. We can so easily live in a circle with ourselves in the centre where we congratulate ourselves, we commiserate with ourselves, we feel sorry for ourselves, we have a lovely time with ourselves, but all the time we're digging a pit of self-pity. Most forms of normal depression stem from, stem from self-pity. Martin Luther was often given to moods of depression. When he came down to breakfast one morning, he found his sister dressed in black. Who has died, he asked, that you haven't told me about? Martin, God is dead, she replied. He rebuked her for such a statement, to which she replied, You're living, Martin, as if God was dead. He then went away and wrote a poem, one verse of which says, Feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. My warren is the word of God, nought else is worth believing. One of my heroes is a man called Martin Niemuller. He was held in a concentration camp for many years and kept for most of them in solitary confinement. He was well and truly locked down and locked in. How did he react? How did he cope? Did he become depressed and feel God had forgotten him and forsaken him? He was allowed just one possession. He chose a Bible. And this was his testimony. The Bible, what did this book mean to me during the long and wearying days of solitary confinement? The Word of God was simply everything to me. Comfort and strength, guidance and hope, master of my days and the companion of my night the bread of life that kept me from starvation, and the water of life that refreshed my soul, and even more, solitary confinement ceased to be solitary. Another man who was in the same boat was the psalmist, as the psalmist was the Apostle Paul. He was cut off from his closest friends, deserted by others, locked in a prison cell and under constant Roman guard. And yet he wrote, at my first de defence, no one came to my support, everyone deserted me. What a sad and lonely moment for this great missionary who had blazed a trial, trail through Asia Minor. He must have searched the courtroom for one familiar face. He must have yearned for one voice that would speak up for his defence. The sense of isolation and desertion might well have broken his heart and sent him back to his cell bitter in resentment with feelings of being forsaken by God. Everyone deserted me, he wrote. But then he added, but the Lord stood by and gave me strength. He stood by my side and supported me. What a comfort, what a blessing to experience the presence of Jesus in his darkest hour. Jesus is never going to desert his people. Friends may fail and forsake us, but Jesus has promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what man can do to me. I recently watched a film on the life of Richard Wurmbrandt, a pastor who was imprisoned in Romania and kept in solitary confinement, one of the cruelest forms of capital punishment. His cell was dark and damp, cold and infested with rats. I don't know whether he felt that he was forgotten and forsaken by God, but I do know that when he prayed, he said, 
The presence of Jesus became so real that I danced all round my cell with great joy. The darkest and most desperate experience of being forsaken by any human being was experienced by Jesus as he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew what it was to be safe, forsaken by his followers, but never to be abandoned by God. But on the cross, Jesus faced the final result of sin, which is to be shut off from the light of God's presence forever. On the cross, Jesus experienced the darkness and desolation of hell itself. But we can say he was forgave, forsaken, that we might be forgiven and enjoy fellowship with him both now and forever. And he was forsaken that we might never be forsaken. Times of crisis and great difficulty will invade our lives from time to time, but he will keep his promise. He will never forsake us. Years ago, I remember singing these words from an old hymn. The soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavour to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Let's close with prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, forgive us if we ever accuse you of forgetting us and forsaking us. Help us always to remember that you've promised never to leave or abandon us, for we are your children. You've chosen to love us and your arms are always open to embrace us and comfort us, especially in our darkest moments. Protect us from turning in on ourselves and wallowing in self-pity. Help us always to turn to you when we need you most and discover that you will strengthen us. Amen.